Hello and uh, welcome to the panel session Leaping from Climate Change to Climate Positivity How to Accelerate Climate Action Through Circular Systems Climate change is undoubtedly a defining issue of our time and we are at a pivotal moment to hold off some of the worst climate impacts and avoid irreversible damage to our societies, economies and planet we must hold temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Policies presently in place around the world are projected to result in about 2.9 degrees warming. The pledges and targets that governments have made, including nationally determined contributions and some net zero targets as of this April, would limit global warming to about 2.4 degrees only. There remains a substantial emission gap still to be addressed. Keeping warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels by 2100 means that the emission of greenhouse gases need to be cut by half by 2030 and brought to zero by 2050. Bold and courageous commitments, policies and actions are required. It is uh, estimated that bold climate action will deliver a direct economic gain of 26 trillion US dollars through to 2030, compared with business as usual. There are real benefits to be seen in terms of new jobs, economic savings, competitiveness and market opportunities, as well as improved well-being for people worldwide. Momentum is building behind this shift, but this is not yet fast enough. Harnessing the power of the private sector, unleashing climate innovation and advancing supply chain transparency will be key to achieving the Paris Agreement. The circle economy has a crucial role to play in tackling the climate and carbon challenge. Today, the global economy is only 8.6% circular. Doubling the current circularity rate could reduce global emissions by, nine, by 39% by 2032. Combining nationally determined contributions with circular economy strategies implemented globally could keep global warming to well below 2 degrees. Efforts to use energy efficiency and the transition to renewable energy will address only 55% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. The remaining 45% must be addressed by transforming the way we make and use products. More than ever before, must we rethink and redesign how we make and use materials and products and shift the entire system. The Cradle to Cradle Certified Products Program provides a leading pathway for putting climate ambitions into action and considering their interconnection with other critical sustainability topics, such as material health, product circularity, water and soil stewardship, and social fairness. How we design and make products today is truly shaping the world we will inhabit tomorrow. Cradle to Cradle Certified is a comprehensive framework made for tomorrow that drives climate positivity by taking a holistic lens to climate action, being rooted in 1.5 degrees as the North Star, and offering a concrete implementation roadmap for science-based targets and sustainability commitments. For achieving climate positivity, it is essential to drive systems change from products to business models, to lead on value chain ambitions in terms of scope three emissions and spur the next generation of climate innovation. There are many opportunities for businesses to seize and to lead the way towards climate positivity. 
I'm very pleased to be joined now by three leaders from our community for a deeper conversation on the subject. Roxanne Spears, Vice President, Sustainability North America at Taquette. Roxanne leads the organization's sustainability and circularity initiatives and policies across research and development, material optimization, and corporate communications. Danielle Azoulay, Vice President of Sustainability and CSR at L'Oreal USA. As part of her role, Danielle oversees the implementation of L'Oreal's global sustainability program, L'Oreal for the Future, which addresses environmental and social impacts across L'Oreal's value chain. And Jimmy Summers, Vice President of Environment, Health and Safety and Chief Sustainability Officer at Elevate Textiles. A manufacturer of distinct, distinguished fabric brands and shred solutions for automotive, apparel, interior furnishing and speciality products. Jimmy is responsible for the EHS and sustainability programs for the company's 40 manufacturing facilities. I encourage all our audiences to submit your questions for this esteemed panel on the right hand side of the screen, and we will address them towards the end of the conversation. Let us start uh, on a personal note and hear from each our panelists. Um, we begin with, with Roxanne, then maybe Jin, Jimmy and Danielle. Which action did you take this morning with a positive impact on the climate? Uh, well, mine's probably a little different, um, but I don't use a dryer. So this morning I hung la laundry out on a clothesline. And Jimmy, which uh, action did you take this morning that's positive for the climate? Well, the, the thing that came to mind is uh, in our break room here at work, I, I looked in the... Uh, in the trash and uh and there were recyclables in there and so i, I picked them out and uh, put them in the recycling <laughs> and danielle your climate action for the day well um today just turning my lights on uh was a positive climate action um i sourced renewable energy through my utility for my apartment so uh that was that was that that's great. Yes, it all starts with us as, as individual persons to make steps towards the what's the 1.5 degrees ambition. Um, your companies have all committed to the science-based targets and to leading the circular transition. And uh, Roxanne, which approach is Taquette taking to lead on the Paris Agreement? And what is in particularly noteworthy about your approach at Taquette? Uh, well, we're we're currently um, evaluating all of our uh, performance and our impact to make sure that we're aligned uh, for the global warming. Um, we were the first flooring manufacturer actually to sign with the UN Global uh, Compact Agreement uh, committing to the UN Sustainability Development Goals. And I really think that was our first step to kind of putting a stake in the ground and saying, we're going to take action and we're going to measure that action. And I think science-based targets helps us measure it, but we really felt we have to start with measuring where we're at so then we can start reducing. Um, in 2010, we set a goal of reducing our emissions by 20% um, by 2020. We hit that goal. Uh, we were looking at 30% reduction 2020 to 2030, but in reevaluating that, we know that's not going to be enough to really hit the targets that need to to change the global warming conditions. So um, I think we were on the right path by having started with measuring it, but now it's really determining for each facility, for each product, what do we need to cut back to make sure that we're making a positive impact, not a negative impact? And I think um, the design strategy that we have in place using um, circular economy as a business model, cradle to cradle is our design model, really sets us on the right path. And so for us, we're going to continue on that path and really dig into making sure we understand what our impact is, both positive and negative, and then be able to change that to make it positive. And a lot of it will be using um, a lot more raw um, 
recycled raw materials rather than virgin raw materials. We know that that really changes uh, the economy scope of what we're doing um, for emissions and for the climate as well. And we, some of the products we use um, a PVB film for and using that as a recycled material really reduces our carbon footprint. So expanding on those strategies as well. Thank you. And we will speak about this uh, a little bit later also in, in the conversation in more detail. Uh, Danielle, how is uh, L'Oreal USA fighting climate change and how far along are you on your ambitions? Climate change is central to all of the sustainability work that we do uh, within L'Oreal and L'Oreal USA. We're also committed to science-based targets um, and have used the planetary boundary methodology to set our targets across uh, climate, uh, water, waste, biodiversity, and natural resources. Really, as a company that is grounded and rooted in science um, with the innovations of our products, felt that the scientific basis and methodology for science-based targets could be applied across the board. And so that really was the framework that we used um, with our newest uh, sustainability strategy, L'Oreal for the Future. Um, with, of course, central to that, everything that we do, um, climate change is, is central to that. And, and that's part of why I love um, Cradle to Cradle so much because there's an emphasis on connecting the dots on, on the work that we're doing uh, at the enterprise level to reduce climate change and making that tangible through our products. Um, and so, you know, connecting the dots, not only to uh, through our CSR reports and, and, you know, communications externally, but actually through our products and the certifications on our products enables our consumers to connect with us on these types of shared values through the certification. And Jimmy, which uh, climate strategy has Elevate Textiles adopted and how do you keep track of the progress made? Yeah, so we um, made our first public commitment to, um, to tracking and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions in 2006. But as you noted, um, we committed to uh, setting science-based targets um, in September of 2019. And so we're actually in the process right now of getting our targets um, set and validated. We, we did our scope three emissions inventory uh, um, this year. And um, we set an interim target on top of, of you know, the progress we had already made um, of 2.5% uh, reduction um, every year through 2025. But um, I'm happy to say this uh, this week, we just signed the uh, business ambition for 1.5 degree um, commitment. And, um, and so we're gonna align our, we're aligning our targets uh, with the 1.5 degree pathway and, and uh, also to being net zero by 2050, which is uh, gonna put us on that pathway. Um, and we're developing those targets now. But, um, but the way we keep track is, um, each of our 40 facilities uh, report their, their data, their greenhouse gas emissions and en energy usage and other sustainability metrics um, to, a month, on a monthly basis to the corporate level to us. And, um, and so we analyze that and, and track it. Um, we track it by business unit. We track it by uh, region. Um, but the real, the challenge now uh, that is, and what we're in the process of doing is um, operationalizing those targets, you know, for each facility to make it and for each business and to make it something that's very uh, visible and, um, and that they can understand how, you know, how they can impact those, uh, those targets and to make it part of our uh, annual business plans and our, our one, three, five year plans and, um, and to also unleash our continuous improvement uh, process and our lean manufacturing tools towards, um, you know, making those uh, continue to make the reductions in our greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, so that's the way that we're tracking progress. Of course, we're reporting it um, publicly through our uh, annual sustainability reports and other platforms, but um, that's how. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks to you three for sharing uh, your climate uh, action strategies. Uh, quite a leadership there and uh, and also the ambition that we need uh, to get on this 115 degree pathway. Um, if we come back to the circular economy and um, how circular systems uh, can be and are an accelerator for the climate action. Daniela, how do you deploy the cradle to cradle certified standard to fulfill your climate challenge? targets and future-proof your business? I, you know, I think because Cradle to Cradle is a multi-attribute holistic approach to sustainability, including climate, it's quite natural um, as we're going through implementing strategies and tactics within our organization to transform our business um, that we're also able to transform our products as well. Each one of our products uh, is measured um, on the environmental and social improvements that are made through the design and development stages of, uh, of the, the product development uh, life cycle through a tool that we developed called SPOT, the Sustainable Product Optimization Tool. And SPOT is quite well aligned with Cradle to Cradle in what it measures as uh, material to product sustainability. Um, and we're now looking at uh, how we can externalize that. We started to do that um, in two ways, through a product impact labeling system uh, where that we launched last year with uh, Garnier in France and has since launched also with Garnier in the UK and hopefully will launch uh, with Garnier this, this summer, where we're trying to build on that trust and transparency, give visibility to our consumers on uh, carbon emissions of that specific product. And we actually rank our products uh, with a score A, B, C, D, or E. And if they fall into the E category, we are making recommendations to buy alternative products that are better for the environment so that we can push our teams to make better decisions as well so that those products score better. Um, also something that is critical, I think, for uh, this connection is, you know, we're mostly a, um, a B2B business, right? We do a lot of our uh, sales through major retailers and that Amazon has recognized uh, Cradle to Cradle as one of their uh, critical badges for the Climate Pledge Friendly Program is really uh, a, a way for us to commercialize sustainability, commercialize these, um, these, these improvements that we're making, educate the consumer right on their website on what Cradle to Cradle is, what it's about, uh, and hopefully that piques curiosity on the other actions that L'Oreal is taking as well. Um, so really, I think it's about building that trust and transparency, communicating the climate work in, um, in a very clear way, utilizing these, these two different tools and strategies. And Jimmy, in which way do circular solutions play a role in reaching your climate and wider sustainability targets? Okay. Yeah, so as a, as a manufacturer of um, fabrics and threads, um, you know, we use uh, a, a large amount of our uh, raw materials it consists of uh, fibers of cotton, polyester, nylon, uh, other synthetic fibers. And, um, and as we have um, conducted our scope three emissions inventory, you know, we've, we've determined that, um, so 53% of our uh, total uh, emissions scope one, two, and three are scope three emissions. And, um, and so circularity really plays in for us the, the biggest way that it um, plays into our, our greenhouse gas emissions and our approach is through the, the fibers and the fiber inputs. And, um, and 22% of our scope three emissions uh, targets are uh, from uh, fibers and uh, and yarns and and um, and those those inputs and so um, while there currently is not a lot of uh, uh, life cycle analysis data on circular uh, fibers, um, you know there's there's some but not a, a large amount. There is a large uh, larger body of of life cycle uh, data 
for um, uh, recycled polyester and sustainable cotton compared to uh, the, the conventional uh, versions of those. And, and uh, the recycled versions are generally about one third of the carbon um, intensity or carbon uh, emissions in the life cycle for those, um, for those fibers. And, and our belief is that for, um, for circular fibers, it's, it's probably that or, or even better. And so um, circular fibers are absolutely um, have to be a part of our, um, uh, our of reaching our sustainability goals of our scope three emissions goals. And, um, and, and in the way that, that I see that playing out, you know, we're, in, we're taking part in cradle to cradle through uh, material health certificate process. And, um, but, but I see this as something where um, it, it's going to be a, um, a partnership with, with our uh, brand and retail customers and, and working together on developing these um, circular solutions, which, you know, right now, um, you know, quite frankly, or, you know, there's some boutique, boutique offerings and there's, uh, but there's the scaling hasn't, the scalability is not there yet, but that's, um, but that's, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely going to be a critical part and is a critical part of us re reaching our sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will come back to the very important aspect of scaling a little bit further down in the, in the conversation. Um, Roxanne, you know, Taquette has been part of the Cradle to Cradle community for, for many, many years. And how is the Cradle to Cradle certification accelerating your product development for a carbon positive future? Well, I think utilizing the Cradle to Cradle philosophy as our design model has really set us on a new path. We're making those evaluations of material health, material utilization, renewable energy. Um, but also we love the part of water stewardship and social fairness as well because of that holistic approach. And for us, um, even if a product is not cradle to cradle certified, we still go through the assessment and optimization. And for us, that optimization of materials has been critical in changing the contents we have. Uh, we got rid of phthalates. We got away from halogenated flame retardants long before it was really required to do so. And all of it was really optimizing and working with cradle to cradle. Uh, one product in particular um, we started working on was a product we have as our Ethos Carpet Tile. And that product we use a PVB film, which is actually from windshields and safety glass. And we use that in creating an alternative to a PVC backing for our carpet tile. The um, Doing this with Ethos Modular has changed a few things. One has changed to a safer chemistry for us. We diverted 35,000 tons of film from landfill, but it also changes the carbon footprint of the product. And using uh, recycled PVB is 25 times lower than it is if we were using virgin PVB. So setting up that cradle to cradle process and helping us move to using more recycled content in our products really has changed how we're looking at um, our not only our carbon footprint creating a carbon positive future but also looking at our facilities um, and we're using the pvb film in another product called id revolution just moving quicker and quicker um, towards that circular economy as well as low emissions Thank you for, for sharing that, um, how you are really making the link practically also between uh, climate action and uh, circular economy and cradle to cradle certified. Um, on the journey to climate positivity, climate innovations and their scaling across value chains are increasingly taking center stage in the discussions. Um, Jimmy, I would like to come back to you and ask you which main technical innovations from your perspective, from your sector, will be required to move to net zero and even beyond to climate positivity? Yeah, um, so technical innovations and, uh, and, and other innovations that are that are going to be needed, I'd say for scope one and two emissions, you know, that we have uh, at our facilities, I would say, um, I think making um, renewable energy and, uh, more financially uh, accessible, um, you know, solar, wind, 
um, cogeneration for steam generation. You know, when we when we're thinking about net zero at a manufacturing facility and and the 1.5 degree pathway uh, is quite daunting uh, from a standpoint of um, you know the, the technology exists, but the um, but it's not financially accessible uh, within the the business models that currently um, that, that currently exist, and uh, and so that's a challenge. So I guess that's not a technical. I guess it is a somewhat of a technical innovation, if the um, you know the technology continues to become more uh, financially accessible and improves and and is more efficient. Um, but that's something that's going to have to, will have to happen. And especially at manufacturing facilities that are very energy intensive, like ours are, um, and, uh, and and water intensive, and and those things in our supply chain, um, and even uh, further up, you know, with our suppliers too. Um, from a uh, for us a scope three standpoint, and what I was talking about earlier with the uh, you know circular fibers, uh, and that being uh, right now, um, you know, there's a lot of research going on. There's a lot of work being done, um, and there's a lot of very, very good, important um, uh, innovations that have happened so far. Uh, but there's, there's still, they're, they're, they haven't been scaled yet to the standpoint uh, that uh, it can have a, a, a really big impact. And I see that as a, uh, a technical uh, innovation that's going to need to continue uh, all the good work that's being done and the work that's being funded um, to be able to scale the, the circular um, the circularity of fibers so that you can take this shirt and uh, and and deconstruct it and and turn it back into uh, fiber that we can then use to weave uh, n uh, new shirts and new uh, threads and new yarns that meet the, the fashion requirements and meet the uh, customer specifications and, uh, you know, durability and, and color and, and other things that, um, uh, you know, that are acceptable to, to, uh, to the end uses. And so those, those, are, the innovate, those are the technical uh, hurdles that we have, but uh, there's a lot of uh, good innovation going on, but those are critical to, uh, to, to uh, moving towards net zero and, and uh, climate positivity. And uh, Roxanne, Jim is mentioning the challenge uh, to, of scaling. Um, in your experience, in your point of view, how do value chains have to adapt, have to transform to really address the climate risks and also scale the circularity approaches? Well, it's, it's definitely not something that as a manufacturer you can do alone. We have to have our suppliers come along with us for this journey. And I think that's been um, one thing through Cradle to Cradle as well is it gave us a metrics to then go to our suppliers and say, you know, this is our guideline. This is what we're going to meet. You now have to meet this guideline as well uh, because we're not going to get there without them meeting the same criteria. So, so for us, that has really helped our journey uh, to have that roadmap to work um, con together on. Um, but the other part um, is we also, as we make strategies for healthy material and we focus on the climate change, um, we also can't do it alone in that. As a flooring manufacturer, we're relying on uh, designers and architects to specify the product, but we're also relying on them to specify what's going to happen at the end of the life of that product. And so if we look at some of the processes that are missing for us is how do we get the product back at end of use? And we're creating projects, products with longer longevity. So how are we going to track this product for 20 years? When it's finally done, it needs to come back or, or have a second life to it. So a lot of times we're trying to work with partners so that um, say a project is in New York City, we don't want to ship 30,000 square feet of carpet tile back to Georgia to be recycled. That just doesn't make sense. But can we find partners in regional markets who can process it, who can give it a second life and really find some opportunity to use it that maybe helps some other products carbon footprint? 
but however we're doing it, it's, it's finding the partners to process. Um, and then also making sure that as a building um, is being renovated, that we're all looking at as, as raw material resources, that we're not looking at all of that's going to the dumpster, how many dumpsters are we going to fill, but really how are we going to separate that material? How are we going to reuse it? And those processes have to happen during the bid process, during the specification process. Um, so I think for the value chain, ours starts with our supplier, but ours goes all the way down to demolition. Um, and it's a long time span, but we need um, processes all the way along and we need everyone to be our partner throughout those processes. Great. Uh, thank you for highlighting also this, this important aspect of, uh, of collaboration, which I'm um, sure we will we'll get uh, probably some questions on. I see actually already a question <laughs> in the chat box we, box we will get to um, after after Danielle. And uh, Danielle, you have mentioned a little bit the role of, of retailers also, and of course, on, on consumer facing companies. So how can a company's focus on climate and circularity drive positive change in consumer choices? I think that, you know, the more um, products, the more suppliers, the more or the more retailers and their suppliers that adopt this, um, this mark, the more visible it will be to, uh, to consumers as a mark of trust and safety and sustainability. And so it, it really is about, you know, when you're talking about, um, sort of the impact on consumers. We know our consumers want to spend more money on more sustainable products. I think there's a lot of confusion out there on what that means and how to make that choice. And what I love about marks like Cradle to Cradle is it just it completely uh, takes away that mystery and sets a level playing field, a level standard on what a sustainable product is, what is the best in class uh, product of, of sustainability, and and I think that's really critical. Um, and uh, you know, and um, any any uh, personal care product companies out there that want to make that change, you know, please contact me. I want to be open about how we can really scale this uh, to to help our consumers make the best sustainable uh, product choices out there. Thank you, Danielle, and, and you have been really extraordinary in sharing some of your learnings with our Cradle to Cradle uh, community al already. I'm actually uh, turning to the chat box here, um, and there's a question I think uh, with relevancy to all three of you would be interesting to hear your perspective um, from your sectors, and that is how do you get multiple suppliers on board to assist with carbon emission data collection for scope three? And maybe we can start with, with Jimmy and then Roxanne and, and then uh, Danielle. Yeah, so yeah, we have just uh, been through that process. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, the reality is we have, uh, you know, we have a variety of suppliers in all of our different uh, raw material sectors, uh, you know, fibers and dyes and chemicals and other thing, other items. But um, and, and we had uh, just varying uh, degrees of participation and uh, and we had to um, we did find some suppliers who were uh, quite willing and, and to, to um, support us and to provide information. Um, and others who, who were not. And uh, of course that kind of uh, starts to inform our uh, going forward relationship with them also. But um, and we tried to explain, you know, why we're doing it. And, and a lot of the, you know, it did call uh, and help us to call into question and think about, okay, what are our criteria for our suppliers? And, uh, you know, we want our customers to, to choose us because, uh, you know, we're, uh, uh, committed to, to doing things the right way, but uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, choosing suppliers uh, the same way. And um, so, but in general, um, you know, we found that our supply base was, um, we found representatives in each uh, category uh, um, sufficient to allow us to calculate our scope three emissions and, um, and, and, you know, a, develop enough information to be able to apply that within the, the scope three um, methodology um, 
to, to represent our scope three emissions. Mm -hmm. And Roxanne, um, how, how is your experience with suppliers and scope three uh, data gathering? Well, it's definitely not an easy, smooth process. Um, it takes uh, repetitive asking sometimes. Uh, but a few things that we've learned is, um, as we set up new suppliers, making sure that that's part of the agreement in the contract, uh, just putting it right in there. Um, and we're we're starting to be very clear now on, you know, that we want alternative bio or recycled material. We want scope three. That that there are certain criteria now. We just put right up front in the contract. Um, some suppliers have been very willing because they want to be part of the process. Others, this is very new to them. And you really have to spend time walking them through the process, providing them, uh, sharing what tools we use to track information so that it makes it a little bit easier for them to figure out. We found if we appear as a partner um, with them, not so much that we're questioning what they're doing, but we really want to partner with you to go the journey together. Um, and then we have had a few um, new suppliers approach us because they do want to go down this path and they, they want to outreach to other companies to make sure that they're we're working together. But um, I think if as you're starting with new companies, if you can get it written right in the contract so that there's no misunderstanding, it's very clear that these are what we are looking for and we will be asking for this information. That That's very helpful, but really trying to approach it as a partner um, helps as well. But there are some suppliers that you're just not going to get there with either, unfortunately. <laughs> it's the reality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Danielle, your best practices um, with uh, engaging suppliers for scope three emissions? Yeah, I think for all of these um, environmental and social um, asks of suppliers, it's important to make it very clear on what you want. But also, I find that suppliers are more willing to go on this journey with you if you're also giving them the tools for how to get there. Because I think that is one of the biggest hurdles is, you know, they don't know where to start. A lot of them don't have, you know, chief sustainability officers. They don't know, you know, really what is the right way to even begin the journey. And so if you can, as Roxanne is saying and, and Jimmy is saying is, really create that partnership, make sure they understand that it's not about being penalized for non-compliance, but it's about building value and building capacity together. This is how we did it. This is what we learned. And this, you know, and, and sort of having those planned moments every year where you can hold summits or seminars, educate, provide educational materials uh, to the suppliers. Um, and make it feel smaller, uh, you know, and more bite-sized, um, I think the more successful you'll be because uh, it can be, it can feel very daunting to just say, okay, well, tell us what your carbon footprint is. If they just have no idea, you know, where do you even start? Um, so we really have to provide the tools, the training, education, and that constant two-way dialogue. Thank you for sharing your experiences here with the audience. I will take one more question from the chat box and that relates to employee uh, retention, employee attraction. Um, how big do you think is the influence of your sustainability aims towards the circular economy for people applying or working in your company to be environmentally um, positive as well as be more motivated to work because there is a purpose behind your business? I think that's a good question for all of you. And uh, Roxanne, would you like to start? Sure. I think um, one thing every company has to understand is that um, the sustainability department may be setting the strategies and the goals and, and monitoring everything that's going on, but every single department is a part of that sustainability journey. I mean, we, we can't reach our goals if operations isn't part of it and understands what we're doing, if procurement isn't, um, but even down to making sure that everyone feels connected to that story, I think then that changes how people coming into your company view sustainability and see the value and the purpose in what you're doing um, and making it personal. Um, we do composting at our facility. Um, we're, now that we're starting to go back in, 
we're looking at can we uh, do textile recycling, having our employees bring in textiles that need to be, instead of just throwing them away, we'll, we'll set up a recycling program. But having them feel a little bit more personally connected to what we're doing so that they can see that it it's not just a manufacturer or a company that's doing this. It's also what you do individually. And then I think talking about the health and welfare of the people in the space and that the products we make affect that. So it affects where you're working as well. And I think that pride in what we're doing carries over to having people want to come work for you um, and be part of that and really make them feel they're part of the journey from the very time they join the company. And no matter what in department they're in, you don't need to be in sustainability to be part of the success and journey of a company on that road. And Jimmy, uh, what are your thoughts on, on this question? Yeah, I think it is absolutely uh, a crucial part of, of um, the future and, uh, and, and for our company and, and attracting the talent and the, um, you know, the type of folks that, um, that we want and, and then retaining them. Um, and because there's, there's you know, a degree of pride, there's a degree of, um, of, of feeling like you're working for a company that um, you know, not only says uh, some, some really good things, but you know, they see evidence that, okay, we're doing it. And, and we're actually, you know, we, if we say it, we do it and, and we mean it. And that's all part of, I think, uh, just feeling good about um, uh, where you work. And, and you know, now uh, more than ever, I think folks have, uh, you know, they have a big choice of, of who they want to work for. And, um, and, and I think sustainability and, and, and having these, you know, being a part of um, the change that is happening and, and committing to it is, um, I think, is just crucially important in attracting the, the, the right kind of talent and retaining that talent. And Danielle, what are L'Oreal's experiences of the combination, you know, sustainability, climate action, goals, ambitions, uh, leadership, uh, and then employee attraction and uh, employee retention? Yeah, I've seen a real shift uh, in the past couple of years uh, where, um, you know, our recruiting teams are meeting with uh, high caliber professionals who won't take the job until they have a talk with me about the sustainability work that we're doing. They really want to make sure that we're not just talking the talk, we're walking the walk too. Um, in 2019, we launched our first ever L'Oreal USA Green Team and within the first month, we had about 250 employees sign up. And so there is a very high level of enthusiasm and motivation. You know, our sustainability program has about 32 KPIs that we're working towards. And not the reality is, is that not all 14,000 employees are actively a part of, every, you know, achieving every single one of them, right? But they need to feel part of the culture connected to the program. And so we've developed the screen team with that uh, goal in mind, providing education resources, bringing in external speakers, um, giving them tools to advocate forward on uh, shared values in their own community. I tell our employees that I really feel like it's my job to build the kind of culture where uh, who they are at home is who they are at work. You know, if you recycle at home, you can recycle at work. If you care about these things uh, at home and in your communities, I, I want you to have an outlet to do that within our corporate culture as well. And so uh, it's, it's critical at this point, especially with uh, the millennials, Gen Z, uh, and, and um I don't even know the next generation coming out of college now. <laughs> Millennials are in their 40s now, which is crazy <laughs> to me. I'm a millennial, but, um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, thinking about how we can really continually provide an outlet and a resource uh, for the next graduating class to plug into this work and feel passionately and, and committed uh, to the program and the company that they, they want to work for. Thank you. 
Um, we have spoken about, you know, you're demonstrating the corporate and the business leadership that it takes uh, for the 1.5 degree pathway. And let us maybe in, in concluding the session also turn to the finance policy and society's role uh, for climate action. And Jimmy, um, who actually should finance climate action and the road to climate positivity and um, where from your perspective does the ultimate responsibility for the implementation achievement of the Paris Agreement lie? Yeah, so as far as financing it, uh, ultimately I think that, that we all um, are responsible for financing it as consumers. So we're all consumers of products um, and, and ultimately, you know, we have to behave in a way that sends the, the, the market signals that, that uh, you know, tells uh, manufacturers and supply chains that, uh, you know, this is, this is the type, these are the type of products that we're going to uh, purchase, the ones that are circular, the ones that um, have the lower impact on the environment. And, um, and that sends, you know, that, that finances it and that sends the signals uh, and creates a race to the top instead of a, a race to the bottom. You know, when we when we go and we're looking for the the, the cheapest, uh, least expensive, uh, you know, we and, and we don't consider the uh, the impact of that product, then we're we're participating in the race to the bottom. But um, but the, the the thing that has to happen to 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 allow that is. Um, more uh, transparency and traceability and making it easier for us as consumers to uh, to distinguish and to know that and that's you know cradle to cradle it, it helps to make that uh, possible to be able to distinguish you know when i go to buy this shirt uh, how do i know um, uh, you know the impact of it and i think the ultimate you know responsibility you know while all of us i mean we're all responsible the whole supply chain and all the way from the consumer, you know, the final consumer, uh, through all of us, through the manufacturers, the brands, the retailers, um, all the way up the supply chain, you know, we're all uh, responsible uh, and have the ultimate responsibility for uh, it, it. Is a it is a partnership. It, it's everybody together. Uh, it, it's not just one sector, um, but we have to to have the transparency and the ability to be able to to know. Uh, and understand um, the, the different uh, impacts of the different parts of the supply chain and the final products. And uh, Danielle, um, looking at actions governments are taking, uh, policymakers um, are doing, which uh, policies or actions or approaches uh, could bring a tipping point for climate progress or at least a significant acceleration? You know, I think that um, I'm hopeful that with this new administration, we're going to be able to accelerate our climate policy and and um, come up with a framework that really serves the moment that we're in. I think, especially as we are rebuilding um, post COVID and hyper focused on jobs and job creation uh, and growing our economy while also uh, you know, mitigating climate change. Um, you know, we're always hearing about um, green jobs as, uh, you know, in the renewable energy sector. And I, and I think that there's also, we should be having the conversation about the remanufacturing sector as well and the jobs potential uh, for, um, you know, a, a national recycling infrastructure. I think the Recycling Partnership put out a publication where, a national recycling program could create 400,000 new good paying jobs. And that's just in the collection, not even when you take into account the reverse logistics, the remanufacturing, uh, you know, um, Roxanne was talking about having to have those local partnerships, right, for uh, being able to process the materials and recycle the materials into something that's usable. And those are all a type of green job as well, right? And, and will aid in um, the acceleration of climate mitigation. And so I think it's another layer of the conversation that we should be having that is really connected to circular economy and circular solutions. 
And Roxanne, these days we have also an accelerated uh, debate around diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, and also climate justice is more and more uh, a topic in, in many mainstream uh, debates. So how can we move towards climate justice and how does the cradle to cradle approach uh, help drive it? I think that's a good question because we don't talk about climate justice enough. Um, using the cradle cradle approach, we had to evaluate water stewardship, energy, carbon footprint, material health, uh, carbon use, and social fairness, um, which means that not only people using our products are assured a healthy product, but we have to really look at the people producing the product are safer, the community that we're producing our products in um, has to be safer and healthier as well. And we think about low income neighborhoods or low income areas really have a lot more manufacturing in them than other communities do, which um, can then lead to higher levels of asthma for the community and water contamination. Uh, we work a lot with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation as well in certifying our products. And one of the um, tests they do every year, is what are the highest communities with the asthma rates and allergy rates? And it's communities with high manufacturing. So as a manufacturer, you have to be looking at what you're doing in the community as well as what you're doing for your products, because it does impact the community. Um, and at Tarquette, we're applying those cradle to cradle principles. So I feel like as we look at water stewardship and the safety of our materials, then we're not releasing contaminated water that's going to contaminate what the community is using. And I think in the past, um, if you were in a, a community with high manufacturing is lower income, there wasn't a concern as to what you were doing. You were the manufacturer where you were making money and that was key. Um, but anymore, as we look at the certification of cradle to cradle, it drives that look at a holistic approach. And that's what we all have to start looking at is it's not just us, but we're a manufacturer internationally and we're impacting many communities, many families, um, as well as the people working for us. So if we're not a good neighbor, then we're contaminating the communities our, our, our people are working in. So I think you, we need to look at that more as a balance. And that's where some of that um, balance and climate justice will come in. And when we're doing the cradle to cradle assessment, we're looking at all of our products. So even though our lowest end product isn't cradle to cradle certified, we still remove phthalates, we still remove the halogenated so that even if you can't ex um, afford the most expensive product we produce, you're still getting a healthier product than what you would have gotten from us years ago because we're following those cradle to cradle principles for everything we make. It doesn't matter the price point. And I think that's the other criteria is as we look at um, developers who are doing low income housing, you know, are they looking at healthy materials? The, the cost difference has come down so much in the last 10 years that there shouldn't be that injustice and imbalance anymore. Let us uh, wrap up uh, these uh, highly interesting uh, panel conversations. I see many, many more questions coming in. So I think we will really have to schedule a follow up uh, panel session at one stage. But let us wrap up with a very short statement uh, from all of you. Let us look ahead to November of this year. Uh, which outcomes do you hope the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow will bring for the climate action agenda and our planet and society at lunch? Uh, Jimmy. I think um, a drive for more, um, you know, transparency and traceability and, um, you know, an openness and uh, to, to, for all to see. Danielle, your hopes for COP26? Uh, really just a, re, a doubling down on our commitment to, uh, to continue to pursue these really big issues together. And Roxanne? I, I think it's really um, a good point of, that, of coming together that, you know, we can't all do it alone. We have to be partners in this, sharing information. Um, there aren't any, that many secrets anymore in any of our industries. So why not share and create a better path that gets us all where we need really need to be and have that positive impact? Well, thank you so much, uh, Roxanne, Danielle, and Jimmy, for sharing your insights with us today and for your leadership in bringing us closer to a true circular economy and a 1.5 degree ambition. Mm -hmm.